Bangladesh, I welcome you to this seminar and dinner. Our purpose today is to enlighten you to a country which has achieved substantial milestones since its birth exactly 50 years ago. Why am I here? As you might see, I'm based in New York. Over the last five to six years, I had the immense pleasure and privilege to do business with a trusted Bangladeshi family, Mr. Samuel Huck, who is managing member of TSI and who is sitting right there discreetly. Since the next step to raise Bangladesh from a frontier market to an emerging market, Sami and I, within TSI Securities Bangladesh, developed a plan to substantially contribute to this transition by planning new financial instruments for foreign investors to have exposure to the local stock markets and especially to facilitate for international investors to come into the country and out, so through the broker-dealer and setting up accounts, both for the Dhaka and Chittagong exchanges. Investment banking services will be developed in parallel. And now I invite you to watch a short movie about Bangladesh that Sami produced, and we will switch to the movie. Bangladesh, a nation that fought and appeared on the world map as an independent nation in 1971. Spearheaded by the father of the nation, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the movement called for greater autonomy and economic freedom for its people. Nine months of blood, sweat and tear raged over every inch of the land, leaving marks that will stay forever. The post-liberation Bangladesh was confronted with some extraordinary challenges to rebuild a war-torn nation. The war led to widespread diseases, malnutrition and starvation. The broken economy of post-war Bangladesh forced the country to rely almost exclusively on foreign aid. From being labeled as a bottomless basket, the nation today has come a long way. Today, under the visionary leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, Bangladesh has adopted a long-term plan to transform the country into a knowledge-based middle-income economy. Bangladesh has an inspiring story of reducing poverty and advancing development. As time passed, the nation kept moving forward and upward. Bangladesh has fulfilled all three criteria for graduation from LDC status and currently meets the World Bank classification for middle income status. Bangladesh aspires to become a developed nation by 2041. From an agrarian economy in the 1970s, Bangladesh today is led by export-oriented industrialization. The country is now the second largest exporter of ready-made garments in the world. The world took notice of this progress and applauded Bangladesh's valiant efforts to expand trade and connectivity. Bangladesh has embarked on and constructed several mega-infrastructure projects creating a seamless connection with the southern part of the nation. The Podda Bridge is being built entirely with our own resources. It will transform the lives of 30 million people across 21 southwestern districts of Bangladesh and increase the GDP by more than 1%. Bangladesh is the eighth most populous country with over 159 million people. The nation has emerged as a global pioneer in adaptation and resilience despite being the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. The Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has proven that investing in climate change is conducive to achieving sustainable social and economic development. Since 2007, 
Bangladesh has benefited through the demographic dividend with more people in the working age population. The future of Bangladesh is very bright because the demographic advantage is producing and helping us having enough skilled and unskilled labor. The geographic location with enough infrastructure development plan is producing dividend from every corner of Bangladesh and Bebza Beza is playing a very good role in this. The young population today is steering and enhancing the productivity of the economy. Political stability has brought a promising and consistent policy direction. Budget allocations for health and education, agricultural and rural development, energy infrastructure, communication infrastructures and others had increased drastically over the period. For the last several years, there is a tremendous growth in bandwidth uses in Bangladesh. If we consider the domestic bandwidth use, uh, it is almost 100%. Launching 3G in 2013, 4G in 2018, with 5G on the horizon, the Digital Bangladesh campaign has made significant strides for the nation's development. This has enabled the MFS sector to prosper relentlessly. Designed to spur the country's economic growth, Bangladesh has made its first voyage to space with Bangabundu Satellite One, a strong symbol of the country's aspiration. Bangladesh is offering the most liberal FDI policy in South Asia, allowing 100% foreign equity ownership with unrestricted exit policy. The policy also includes generous tax holidays, reduced tax rates for specific sectors, bond facility, export and other fiscal incentives. The government has planned to establish a total of 100 economic zones with 97 of them already approved. The pharmaceutical market of Bangladesh is expected to surpass 6 billion US dollars by 2025. Bangladeshis spend around 2.04 billion US dollars abroad annually for medical treatment, which is 1.94% of the country's GDP, which shows immense growth potential in the healthcare sector. As for mergers and acquisitions, there have been some significant developments. JDI's acquisition of Dhaka Tobacco amounted to 1,459 million US dollars. Unilever Bangladesh acquired an 82% stake of GSK Bangladesh amounting to 240 million US dollars. Merger of Robi Asiata and Airtel Bangladesh at 148 million US dollars. Evercare Group acquired Apollo Hospitals Dhaka at 118 million US dollars. In the local and international electronics manufacturing industry, Walton, the country's only compressor manufacturer, is holding a 70% share in the refrigerator market. Samsung established two manufacturing plants in Bangladesh to produce mobile devices, refrigerators, air conditioners, LED televisions and microwave ovens. With smart capital investment, local startups like Patao, Chaldal, Shahoj, Shopup are having major success in the e-commerce sector. Offering new innovations to the consumers, these businesses have taken the market by storm. We are uh, going to connect the country with the third submarine cable. Next two to three years, we'll take our initiative to connect the country with the fourth submarine cable also. I can assure that, that there will be no shortage of international bandwidth in the country in, in the future. The world economy took a major blow due to the coronavirus pandemic. Despite that, Bangladesh maintained a steady GDP growth rate, surpassing its neighbors. Bangladesh stands out as one of the best options to invest in and ensure sustainable returns on investment. With faster economic growth, 
shock-absorbing capability against global volatility, stable foreign exchange rates, favorable interest rate trends, and no pre-approval to repatriate, we have the recipe to success. The reasonable wage that Bangladesh is offering because of the population and trained and skilled unskilled labor force, uh, infrastructure, energy, and uh, port and other facilities that are improving day by day, the cost of production and the productivity, both are getting better day by day. And that's why Bangladesh is the next destination for the investors, businessmen, and traders of the world. Following that, we have track records of remarkable progress in the last 50 years. And of course, the uninterrupted flow of educated and trained human capital. Bangladesh is finally here. Bangladesh is ready. Invest in Bangladesh. Invest in the people of Bangladesh. We did apply to the Guinness Book of Records for the most, mentioning the most time Bangladesh per minute. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Shamal Dutta, who is a longtime friend, journalist in Bangladesh, also has an economic program, television, and he is going to introduce the chairman. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our Honorable Chairman of the Security Exchange Commission, Professor Shibli Rubayat al-Islam. Uh, under his leadership, a new, totally new, and a very dynamic Exchange Commission is working now. And under his leadership, we will go long forward that, I believe. I will speak on very short about him, uh, then he will speak on that. Professor Shibli Rubayat has been in the field of finance and banking education for more than last two decades. During this period, Professor Shibli has played an active role in many business, chamber, research related to finance and the banking field at home and abroad. Author of the finance and banking textbook for the secondary students published by the National uh, Board of uh, Professor Shibli Rubat has been in 15 research publications in the field of five international research papers presentation abroad. Before uh, joining to Security Access Commission, he was the Dean of uh, Business Faculty of the University of Dhaka. I will not speak more on that. I will, he will speak and when you will listen him, then you will understand about his all about. Please, Professor Shibli Rubat Aslam. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Shamal Dutta, for uh, speaking so high about me, which is actually not that true. So uh, we have our uh, Honorable uh, Chairman of Bangladesh Export Processing Zone Authority, Major General Azul here, our Chairman of uh, NRB Bank, a very reputed journalist from uh, Channel 71 of Bangladesh, Mr. Babu and uh, their in UK also, I see a lot of uh, known faces here, and uh, especially the host. And uh, where is the main host? Oh, oh, Rain is at the back. So thank you very much for inviting us, and thank you uh, for others that uh, you are present to you are spending your uh, variable time for us. Uh, we are here in UK. Uh, we came a day before, and just now. TSI Securities has just now presented a glimpse of what is happening in Bangladesh. Actually, the reason what what uh, the reason that we are here today is that uh, more than 600,000 Bangladeshis are living in UK. We have a long history, few hundred years of uh, bondage together with United Kingdom. United Kingdom played a very good role during our liberation war. And uh, after independence also, the NGOs, non-government organizations from UK and the government, the people of United Kingdom play, played a very good role helping Bangladesh to 
uh, stand after such a bloody war and uh, devastated Bangladesh. From then on, due to that reason, because at that time and from then on, all the world media and uh, the publications in the print and electronic media, we saw that uh, only the negative things are coming and everyone knows the negative things about Bangladesh and what is happening there for last few decades. But uh, when uh, Dr. Samsuddin, Dr. Mahamuda and a uh, few of us, we were moving around as a university professor visiting different, different countries. We saw that even the intellectual world, the university, university students, who should know more about the geography and the history and recent uh, developments, they, they do not know anything about Bangladesh. And the recent changes that are happening, the, <clears throat> the developments that's, that are happening are not known to anyone. And we found that now it's time to rebrand Bangladesh. And we have to tell the rest of the world that we are doing very well, we are no more a country importing food or looking for food. We are a food exporting country. We are industrializing our country and in Bengali uh, what we say, onno bostro bashosthan, that means food, accommodation and uh, clothing. These are the three primary requisites that a person or a society requires. And uh, we started at first under the dynamic leadership of our current Prime Minister, who during her uh, last two tenure, um, actually mainly uh, 12 years, she gave a great leadership and uh, she with her maturity <clears throat> and her uh, father, who was actually the father of the nation, following his wisdom and his uh, uh, golden Bengal making plan, she started doing one after another the good things we initially we did not understand. When she spoke about a digital Bangladesh 25 years back, we thought, what is she saying? Digital Bangladesh 25 years back was actually not clearly understandable, but today we know why she was saying that. And one after another, she took such a good decision that agriculture, we are now self-reliant, clothing, we are the second largest exporter, you just saw. And then uh, accommodation, housing, home, we are the city is saturated. Now it's expanding around this country. And we are now heading for challenges, the challenges that we will be facing uh, relating to fourth industrial revolution. You just saw that already electronics and uh, heavy industries are coming up. That's why Samsung and uh, Hyundai cars, Proton cars, uh, next uh, Mitsubishi cars are coming. And now India and uh, Bangladesh is jointly making a project to manufacture car, uh, bus and trucks in Bangladesh. So gradually automobile industry is also coming. So engineering, IT, mechatronics, robotics, uh, in computer science also, they're doing quite well, the software export, the other uh, IT related business like uh, people uh, living in UK and USA, now they're employing our youths who are living in Bangladesh. They're giving them, uh, we call it, I forgot the term, uh, okay. Outsourcing, but uh, no, there's a term that they do that uh, even the doctors prescribing in New York, the prescription is actually made in Bangladesh and it's through email going to the patient in New York. And uh, they're sitting call centers also. So these are the things that are happening and uh, hundreds of thousands of youth are now currently working for the Western world. So there are many things that are happening which you do not know probably. So that's why we are here. We are here to change the perception that the developed world knows about Bangladesh. And reason we are here is not only to inform you, but also to inform you that you can also take advantage out of it. How? Because UK is a developed country. 
UK is our proven friend and partner. And what UK has, probably we do not have. Like the R&Ds, research and uh, innovations and developments that you are doing, your uh, specialization, your medical science, your genetic science, your IT related uh, innovations. So these are the things you are very good at. But if you compete with the rest of the world in manufacturing, probably your price will be a little bit higher and you will not be able to compete with the rest of the world. But as just now the presentation you saw, we have a demographic advantage. And we have people there waiting for you to serve you and who are educators, semi-skilled, skilled, and the workers are there. And the export processing zone, economic zones, if you have your plants there, the products that you will be manufacturing in Bangladesh will be very competitive. And the in investors or the businessmen who are having good business in UK will make a good profit out of it, and the margin will be high. The product that you'll be selling will be uh, selling more worldwide because of the cost effectiveness. Yesterday we went to Marks and Spencer in Oxford Street and we saw, I went to the men's department, I was touching every shirt manufactured in Bangladesh. So that means Marks and Spencer is also taking the advantage of manufacturing in Bangladesh. So this is not only one case, I can tell you many in the pharmaceutical sector, the expensive medicines manufactured in Europe, if you produce in Bangladesh, it will be so cost effective that UK pharmaceutical industry will be benefited. Your uh, beautiful electronic and electric cars that you are uh, inventing here, if you produce there, will be very uh, cost effective. And already people are thinking about having their manufacturing plants in Bangladesh. So. These are the small, small things that we want to put together. If these pieces, if we put together, Bangladesh will be benefited because we have a large population and employment will be generated. We'll have our export earning, our export reserve, our current account balance will be uh, better. On the other hand, the investors who will be investing in Bangladesh will be making better margin, more profit, more quantity of uh, marketable products around the world. And Britain can, again, uh, rule in many, many sectors like before because of the competitiveness. So these are the uh, partnership that we are here for. We are not here for any more loans or helps or anything. We are here for partnership. We want British and Bangladeshi business people to work together so that it becomes a win-win situation for all. And hopefully tomorrow in our uh, investment summit, our presentation by the government officials, the business and chambers, businessmen and chambers will impress you and uh, definitely people who will be present there will uh, spread out the news that this is what is happening and take advantage out of Bangladesh. And this is uh, the branding initiative that we, that we are doing, the image building uh, initiative that we are doing and we are trying to take those age-old perceptions away from the world. So we are here for the, that purpose only. And uh, I, ha I really want to thank TSI, Shamal Dotto and others involved today for inviting us to this wonderful uh, Canary Wharf uh, business area, which is really uh, wonderful to uh, visit. And the iconic buildings are so nice to uh, see. So thank you very much, and uh, hopefully uh, you will join us tomorrow in our show. Invitation is open for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It resumes the potential and now we have to act on it. So therefore, um, in order to do it in a little different format, uh, we decided on a to go for a smaller panel today of speakers. Um, and the reason being that living in New York, I see all these panels with five, six people, seven people. By the time they introduce themselves, 
we have time left for one question. <laughs> and it's not really useful. So today, we have the pleasure of having one of these unique people that I met about seven years ago now in New York, this Courtney Finger. And she will be the moderator on a three-person panel. So let me introduce her. Uh, she is Editor-in-Chief of Investment Monitor, a digital publication focused on foreign direct investments, which launched in September 2020 and is part of Global Data PLC. Before joining the group in spring 2020, Ms. Finger spent 15 years with the Financial Times where she was Editor-in-Chief of FDI magazine and the head of content for its associated data division, FDI Intelligence, as well as a contributing writer for the FT newspaper. I have to say that I learned about her leaving that magazine by not seeing her picture anymore in my magazine that I was looking forward every month. She has covered business stories in all major regions of the world and has been on assignment to more than 80 countries in her career. She, was twice being, she has twice been called to give evidence to the UK Parliament as part of select committee inquiries on inward investments. She also worked as a journalist in Washington DC. She is a popular panelist and moderator, as I said, at international economic gatherings and has appeared on television and radio in dozens of countries as a commentator on international investment. Today, she has graciously accepted to moderate our Bangladeshi panel. Before she comes up, I would like to introduce the other panelists besides our chairman, and it's Kimberly Long. She is associate editor of the Banker magazine. Her role involves covering banking, capital markets, and transaction services from Central Asia to the Pacific Islands. She joined from Euromoney, where she spent four years as transa transaction services editor. Previously, she was acting editor of Trade Finance magazine, part of the Euromoney group. So please, all three of you come to the stage. now. There we go. Got it. OK. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and, and mostly thank you um, uh, to TSI for inviting me to this event. Um, the reason I decided to do it was not just to get a, a free dinner and a, and a nice view, it was because Bangladesh is among the places that I've, I've not been yet, I, I hope that will change, but it is quickly emerging on our radar because it is an exciting and fast developing investment destination of which we need to know more about. So this was a bit of a chance to educate myself about what's happening um, in Bangladesh, what it might offer to foreign direct investors, and what the, what the plans are for future development. So I enjoyed um, hearing from the chairman to give us essentially the pitch and how you see things. I'm going to pick up on some of those points and ask you a bit further. And very happy to have Kimberly here as well. We were actually colleagues at Financial Times. In fact, we sat next to each other in the old pre-COVID um, days when people hung around in an office all day. Um, and as you'll have heard from her bio, she is an expert, she's the Asia editor as well of the banker, so can place some of what's happening in Bangladesh into a regional and global context and is an expert on capital markets and banking. So she can maybe, she can give a bit of a review on what she's heard from the chairman and what that might mean uh, for the industry that she covers. So let's begin. Um, chairman, you mentioned about the rebranding um, exercise and you want to shed some misconceptions and create a new image. And we don't need to dwell too much on, on what the negatives are, but what do you feel are those perhaps unfair or outdated misconceptions that you would like to clear up? And then related to that, or I guess following on from that, what would you like the new brand of Bangladesh to be? So when when we think um, globally about Bangladesh, what should we be thinking about? Thank you. 
first of all, uh, I'll point only the main uh, image building areas where we're working on literacy. Just uh, during, a, just after our independence, the literacy rate was around 70, 17 to 22 percent. Today it's 75 percent. Especially, uh, there was a gender issue. The women, they were left behind. And now, they're in, during my tenure as the dean of the business school, I found that in our faculty, in the business studies faculty, 51, 49. 51 is female student, 49 is men. So I found how the gender issue is changing in Bangladesh. I'll show tomorrow in my presentation that uh, if you compare to India and Pakistan and other neighboring countries that we have, now 42% of our women population, I mean female, are working. Whereas in India and Pakistan, it's ranging between 17 to 32%. Uh, so more uh, female population is now getting engaged in the development process. Third is food, that food was an issue that we were looking for, food subsidy, food help, importing food from here and there, but the situation has changed. The staple food that we have, the rice, we are exporting that. We have uh, agricultural products. You'll find in many stores in London, the fish and vegetable, those are all coming from Bangladesh. We are also exporting meat now. <clears throat> to big uh, groups, conglomerates are now uh, exporting meat in the Middle East. And you know, uh, in Islam religion, halal meat is an issue, and these companies are exporting halal meat to Middle East and other countries. So food, we are more or less self-reliant. And even we have excess production. Having 170 million people living in a uh, place which is uh, of the size of uh, one and a half time of New York State, the density of uh, population is uh, one of the highest in the world. So this country is self-reliant, feeding 170 million, that is half of USA, and exporting food is actually a big challenge that we have recovered from. Then let's come uh, to the other issue, energy. A country which was short of electricity, which was short of uh, gas. We have our own natural gas, but due to now industrialization and heavy use of uh, gas, we are now having our own gas, plus we are having LNG and other plants, and we are having right uh, sourcing from the rest of the world. So gas solution is made. Electricity, we have excess production. One stage, it was black every day, four to five hours. Now we have so much of excess electricity produced that the government is so worried that where we will sell this because the production is too much. But we are coping up with the situation that now 100%, almost now it's 99%, Bangladesh is covered with electricity connectivity. So energy solution is made. Airlines, railways, shipping industries, Bangladesh Biman, the national airlines, having other private airlines, they are now doing wonderful business and they are fully, uh, I mean, Bangladesh Biman has enough aircraft than they need. The latest, the Biman aircrafts are the, uh, in terms of aging, are the, in terms of aging is the most uh, young fleet of the world now. The Bangladesh Railway is buying uh, engines one after another, and now we are buying the locomotives to make it uh, very modern and uh, electric. Uh, magnetic rail connectivity is now under uh, Spanish uh, survey, so that they give us the project with the financial plan so that we can do it around Bangladesh. Shipping industry, they are buying their own vessels, uh, six they are buying now more are coming. So we are having our transport solution. We are having huge infrastructure development just now you saw in the presentation. In the infrastructure development, we have a lot of international partners, China, UK, USA, South Korea, India, everyone is with us. 
So everyone is taking advantage out of it. And when I say that uh, electronics, we have Samsung and other uh, Hyundai and other companies are there. When we say that infrastructure, you ha we have our international partners are there. When we say in the uh, export processing zone, he has uh, how many countries are invest? 38. 38 countries having more than 500 industries in the export processing zone, that means that they are investing in Bangladesh and they're taking their profit out of Bangladesh. That's why they're there. And the number is going one after another. We are now planning not to have more EPZs. We are now planning to have economic zones. So 100 economic zones are coming up. That day I was joking with my wife that 30 years before when I was with my grandfather, we had a lot of water problem. The water supply, it was short, different event was dirty water. So when I met the honorable chairman of WASA, he's here, he's taking care of the water supply of Bangladesh. I told that now I know him and I have no problem. I, I needed him 30 years before when I have so many problems, but I cannot uh, tell him that I have this problem, please help me. So I, I was telling, joking with her that I know him after so many years when I have no problem. So this is how things are changing in Bangladesh. So these are the messages that we want to give to the rest of the world that please come to Bangladesh, be our partner and take advantage out of the situation. That's a, a good message. And you, you mentioned, first of all, the, the massive population um, and also the big objectives and the big ambitions that the country has. So I want to talk a little bit about the impact of the COVID crisis. We kind of always have to tick that off our list on any discussion, don't we? Um, to what extent did that hinder or set back any of the progress made and how well did the country cope with the crisis? For example, it seems to have been a little less, um, uh, perhaps slightly came out of it a little better than the neighboring India, for example. Why might that be and, and where, where is Bangladesh now in terms of recovery? The day we flew to UK, the daily death rate was 6% per day. And uh, I was reading the newspaper that in US it was 1,450. So the country who invented and supplying vaccines to the rest of the world, having one and a half thousand deaths per day, and Bangladesh is having six percent per day. In addition to that, I don't know what happened. Probably the population of Bangladesh has a better uh, immune system. And I, I feel staying in Bangladesh that this disease is actually a disease of immune system. Because the richest man living in a house alone, uh, self-isolation, no man, nothing is coming inside, only the virus is going inside. So virus is killing anyone, anywhere, nothing can stop. But the people working in the streets, people working in the garment industries, thousands of workers working together, even staying in, some of them are living in the slams. Nothing is happening to them. So uh, it's, I feel it's a, a disease of immune system that you can protect yourself for, from this disease or not. But now after vaccination, Bangladesh, uh, do, though we are uh, uh, just a lower middle income country growing, but the vaccination went out very well. And uh, you know, not like here or in USA, that you have to push people to come and take vaccine. You have to take vaccine. Our people are rushing and uh, you know, it's a big line every day that people are coming to take vaccination. And we have our vaccination source from China. UK was the first uh, AstroGeneca that I took. Then uh, USA, Pfizer and everything, every vaccine is now available in Bangladesh. Now, the Chinese government, uh, the Sino uh, farm, they want to manufacture in Bangladesh. And one of our private uh, pharmaceutical company, they have signed an agreement and from probably December, January, they will have their own vaccines available and manufactured there. So we have uh, managed uh, this COVID uh, very well, I would say, because the total number of death that we have is uh, in a peak day equal to two days death of USA. Because in some days I saw five, 6,000 deaths in uh, USA per day. In Russia I saw yesterday 1,000. 
but in Bangladesh it's not like that. So this is how we have managed COVID situation and if you see the statistics that Bangladesh during COVID is the highest growth uh, that has happened to our GDP during COVID if you compare to any country in the world. Like during COVID also, we had 7 to 8 percent before, but during COVID it was 5 to 6 percent growth rate. So that means we were working, we were not afraid, even my commissioner, myself, we never missed our office a single day. We were every day working, not from home, in the office. And we worked 100% days, never left uh, our office for a single day. So this is how we took the challenge of COVID, and that's how the economy is giving dividend. It's good you're able to keep the momentum up. You, you mentioned the garment industry, and in your talk before, you spoke about some of the newer industries that are being attracted, automotives and other. How important will the garment industry stay for Bangladesh? Because that's really, I guess, where it made its name as an investment destination. But what often happens is you eventually move, I guess, up the value chain and into other industries. So what role would that industry have in the, in the future development of Bangladesh? Uh, garment industry is playing a very good role from the earlier 80s in Bangladesh and uh, now it's at the, at the peak of producing the uh, I would say the basics that we say like t-shirts, polo shirts, basic shirts. The per capita income has recently crossed two thousand dollar in Bangladesh and you know our per capita income has crossed Indian per capita income already for the second consecutive year. So as per our uh, academic uh, research that uh, we found the data that as soon we'll cross $4,000 will not be able to uh, be as compatible as we are today. So gradually the BGMA president, our association president is also here, he will speak tomorrow. Gradually we are shifting to the next level that is the fashion industry. So the all the latest machines and the other things that they require for fashionable production of uh, different different uh, dresses and have started. Now Bangladesh also exporting pleasures and uh, high-end uh, fashionable products. So gradually within the next five, ten years, we will move from basics to the fashionable. In the meantime, the industry will shift from light engineering to heavy engineering. Light call center to heavy IT and uh, you know artificial intelligence and other uh, industries. So things are happening uh, step by step in a very systematic manner and we are very happy about it. That's why the employment generation is getting uh, faster and as we have 52% of our population of below 30 years of age, we have huge energy in the country and they are producing and the productivity and production is uh, really interesting. Great. We do, we do have a, a journalist here who's from a leading publication that's focused on apparel and, and textile industry who's probably going to pick on you with some questions when we open up the floor. Um, so I'll let her um, cover those. I, I think Kimberly might want me to ask you, I guess, before we turn to her about the financial services industry and what are your aspirations. So what opportunities are there? Obviously, we're here in, the, in, in London and there are you know, clear linkages I assume you would want to exploit when it comes to capital markets, banking and financial services. What are the opportunities that should interest people here? We were here, just two building beside you, the HSBC uh, office today, for five hours back. I was looking for the building. So uh, we were there today. We were having discussion with the head of the organization, with all the departments. And uh, we told them that uh, why you are doing only trade finance today in Bangladesh? Why you are not doing other business in Bangladesh? Come tomorrow, we'll give you the custodian license. We'll give you merchant banking license. You, we'll give you uh, capital market uh, related, all the business that you want to do. So we requested them to come because they were doing only money market, partly short term financing. So we have encouraged them to come for a bond and other uh, equity market participation. We have also requested them that uh, you start competing with Standard Charter and other city bank and other banks, and also with local banks, because uh, very interesting development has taken place. And uh, last month in October, 
our export of uh, ready-made garments uh, is 60 percent growth and overall export growth is 22 percent. So last uh, September it was 55 percent. That means the orders from China, from Vietnam is closed due to COVID and uh, Myanmar you have, you know that there are political situation there. So all the orders from China, Vietnam and Myanmar they are shifting to Bangladesh now. So that's why we have a huge pressure on our RNG production. And that's why the growth is there. So uh, we feel that uh, uh, in the money market, there are plenty to do. That's why we want UK banks to come, take advantage out of our export growth, our banking uh, possibilities, and also in the capital market. Capital market, uh, uh, we are doing a wonderful job. Dr. Samsuddin is playing a wonderful role there as the commissioner. We have new uh, products introduced in the Chitong Stock Exchange, the commodity market. So there you have huge opportunity. We have recently, we were a little bit, uh, uh, I would say we, we were not coping up with the time and we were a little bit late in having bond as our instrument for industrialization that has started. And within last uh, one and a half year, we have uh, probably issued more than $3 billion worth of bonds. So that is a new market where UK investors can take advantage out of it. That's what we gave the message to HSBC authority. And tomorrow in our show, the global head of Standard Charter Bank is coming. So he's coming to hear what we want to say. And probably the international banks will have their new strategies for doing business with Bangladesh. The opportunities in the money market and capital market are huge. And uh, that's why probably Dr. Samsuddin, when we were entering HSBC head office today, uh, he told me, I see here Hong Kong, Dubai, London, and New York. When Dhaka will come, I said after our visit. <laughs> Good. Well, well, Kimberly, what do you make of of what you've heard, how do you see the opportunity that Bangladesh might present? And I guess, based on your experience um, a around the region, what lessons could maybe be learned from elsewhere? Yeah, sure. So I think coming tonight to listen about Bangladesh, I mean, unfortunately, I've not been able to visit, and I hope to rectify that soon, like Courtney does. Um, you know, there is this perception, really, I think, of Bangladesh manufacturing being really focused on kind of the lower end um, garment industry. So it's not very not very high value, not highly skilled, but from what you're saying, it was really interesting to see Samsung, for example, moving in and obviously South Korean as well company. So you're really looking across the whole of the Asia region now in terms of getting that investment and also the upskilling that comes from that as well and creating more kind of highly skilled jobs as well in the country. It's very interesting to see that kind of progress starting to be made there. Um, and I think as well, there's a lot of other ideas as well coming through, like with the infrastructure projects, for example, like the bridge to connect to different parts of the country and how that will benefit such a huge number of people as well. And, you know, there's a lot of, I think, opportunities in terms of infrastructure, but, you know, I think there's still some perceptions around issues within um, Bangladesh. So, you know, for example, there's still this idea around like the ease of doing business is not so great there and there's you know the possibility to move further up the chain in terms of allowing greater um, accessibility to international companies um, maybe to create a more liberalized legal framework for example and how that would attract more international investors and to maybe liberalize the laws a little bit as well to that would also really open up to a greater number of markets and bring in more investments. I think these are some of the perceptions that would be seen from the international community into why maybe they would not want to do business in Bangladesh at this time. But from what you're saying, these are all things that are already in, you know, in your mind that there is a movement forwards in this to, to open up more. Um, and these are the things that will attract the, into the country more. And, you know, it's interesting to see how the GDP, it's sustained so well over the last year. And, you know, maybe that's partly because, like you say, in some other countries, manufacturing has moved into Bangladesh, especially around, say, China and Vietnam, where things did slow down because of the pandemic. And if Bangladesh managed to stay open throughout, suddenly it became a very attractive manufacturing base. So, you know, that's another aspect as well where we're really potentially going to see some more growth moving forward if it is seen as being a reliable location and like you say that politically is very stable as well how this is going to um, 
attract more investment into the country as well. You know, there's a really strong appetite for FDI. I think the Bangladesh just needs to be seen as being a country that is open to people from across the world to come in and to invest. Uh, in, in my speech, I was saying that uh, when 25 years before our Honourable Prime Minister was talking about digital Bangladesh, we did not understand what she was saying about. You're right. That is another perception, that Bangladesh is very difficult to move a file, there is corruption and something like that. The situation has changed a lot. Now, everywhere we are having our IT application. Everything is gradually moving and shifting to online uh, platform. This will not only reduce, uh, I mean, the speed of doing a business, also reduce the cost and the time frame. And that's why the IT application and digitalizing Bangladesh, uh, this, this uh, strategy is working very well. I won't say that it's 100% done. But every week, every month, every day, something is happening to improve the situation. Tomorrow, our BIDA, Bangladesh Investment Development Authority, will definitely show you that how he has 73 process of different, different application and processing and uh, investment things made online. Bebza, he's totally on IT base now. So Bangladesh Export Processing Zone Authority is totally IT based. Wasa, he has totally made it digitalized. You can pay the bill, you can check everything online, and you don't need to go to any bank or anything to pay any bills or anything anymore. So he, he and I, I can cite a lot of example nowadays that they're changing to IT just because to give a better business, better service, and to uh, reduce the application approval process. The banking industry, Mr. Mahatav is the chairman of a bank. They are also uh, moving to uh, from, uh, we call it distributed banking system to centralized banking system. And this uh, CBS is, uh, the system is really working well now. Banking system is almost online. Other than big loans, everything you can do now online in Bangladesh. So that's why uh, you're right, but now things are changing and uh, I hope within uh, next year you will see more changes in my capital market because now we are working to totally digitalize our capital market. So everyone can uh, trade from anywhere in the world 24-7 uh, and uh, all the financial transactions will also will be also able to do online. Thank you. Um, and Kim, are there examples you might point to, you know, other other success stories in the region? I mean, it, it would seem maybe Vietnam is a, a model to look at. And then I'll ask the, the chairman if maybe you see those places as models to look to as well. Yeah, I think definitely where you can see how other countries have started to move up the value chain in terms of the manufacturing. And I think it was interesting to hear about the economic zones as well that you're opening, because I think you see in so many countries like the free trade zones and both Courtney and I are very familiar with Kazakhstan and what they've done there as well. And kind of having that space to welcome international investors in and to give them a place where they can operate freely and where they understand the laws very clearly as well. I think they're really, you know, that it's the transparency really that they're looking for as well. So I think those kind of ideas are really helpful in kind of drawing in more investment. And I think another point to mention as well really is around kind of the Islamic finance aspect as well. I mean, that's something that I personally have somehow become some of them not an expert on, but I cover quite a lot because I find it such an interesting area of banking and also in the region it's such a huge area of potential and there is so much desire and so much appetite for looking to invest in, you know, Sukuk bonds, for example, and not only from the Islamic world, but also kind of from the you know, conventional banking side looking for another alternative investment. I think that is another avenue as well that could possibly be explored. You're right, and uh, that's why we have uh, in Bangladesh a uh, lot of banks now having Islamic banking system. Many banks, like his bank, is having a, two different windows. One traditional banking window, the other one is Islamic banking window. In our capital market, like other bonds, like uh, perpetual bonds, subordinate bonds, and other regular bonds, we now have super bond. 
Sukuk bond from the public uh, issue that government has made in order to have the water purification and supply system. It was 14 times oversubscribed. And now uh, we have the first uh, green bond for a solar power project issued. It's a very ambitious first project actually. And this is worth around uh, 200, uh, yes, 250 million dollar. And so far 150 million dollar already subscribed. So this is how we are popularizing the Sukuk bonds, the Islamic products in Bangladesh. And we know there is a trillion dollar investment lying around the world for Islamic financing. So this is also what we are uh, really uh, keen to look uh, into and uh, development on that part is also on a move. Thank you. Definitely an exciting area of opportunity for you there, Minnie. Um, I don't want to keep you too much from the dinner, but I feel like we should take a couple questions from the audience because obviously it's great to have engagement. Um, back, sorry, you, you have a person there? No. What is the um, market cap of uh, today's Bangladesh stock market? Uh, just to give you an idea that uh, one year, a little more than, less than one and a half year, we took the responsibility. It was not so well. It was 11% of our GDP. But within one year, it's now 20% of our GDP. That is, only within one year, we have increased 9%. And uh, the size of our uh, market cap is, uh, it was 35, 40 billion probably, but today it's 67 billion US dollar. In the equity market only, I'm not talking about the yeah, other yeah, the, market. And, and the, uh, the stocks are traded in the local currency or are there any ADRs? At this moment in local currency, but uh, when you want to invest from UK, you have to go through your NITA account. Uh, it's a non, non-resident uh, investor's TAKA account. So if you send, uh, for an example, 10,000 pound to Bangladesh through this account, it will be converted to a local currency and uh, you can trade and make money out of it. And through the same account with your profit, you can bring the money back without any approval or, or any, any restriction. You can bring your capital and your profit together uh, through the same currency through which you have invested. Like if you uh, invest through pound, you will get pounds back. If you invest through dollar, you will get the dollar back. So any convertible currency of the world you can use in order to invest and take out of Bangladesh without any approval. And last question, is there a central depository? Yes, we have a CDBL already. And uh, the second one is uh, called... Uh, Central counterparty is also coming, so we will be having within next year our uh, day trading more uh, transparent and more uh, better service providing. So CDBL is already there, Central Depository, and CCBL is coming. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the questions. I think there's a question here in the front. Thank you very much. The microphone's coming now. I'm from Just Style, so it'll be apparel questions. Um, you spoke about, in your initial speech, you spoke about the importance of the cost effectiveness and profit. Is it working? I'll speak a bit closer to it. In your um, initial speech, you spoke about the importance of cost effectiveness and profit margins um, for countries like the UK who want to work with Bangladesh's apparel industry. And during the panel discussion, you mentioned the future of the apparel industry for Bangladesh being more about high-end fashion and focusing more on that more expensive apparel good. Um, so I was wondering, how does Bangladesh plan to make this switch? And what effect will this have on international brands and retailers and countries like the UK that currently work with the apparel industry in Bangladesh due to those profit margins and cost effectiveness? Uh, I will start with a sad story that uh, when we started this business, and uh, when we were doing a very competitive business, uh, Bangladesh was a little bit exploited. And uh, the buyers from UK and other European countries, they were squeezing them so much that their profit margin went down huge and the margin was little. In some cases what happened that, uh, today also we were discussing that 
a buyer of UK or European uh, destination, they have a problem in UK or they become bankrupt or they have some other issue here, they immediately cancel those orders. 4,000 plus factories are closed in Bangladesh just because of the problem happened around the world because the buyers cancel their orders or just, I mean, because of their business problem, they did not take the delivery, goods lying at UK port and auctioned. And the, on the other part, the factories in Bangladesh, they were forced to be bank defaulter and then closing the factory. But due to the competitive business scenario today, uh, it's changing. Now they are having a little bit more uh, bargaining power. The price they are now negotiating hard. And uh, now the basics even, where they had no margin, they were just leaving. Now they are adding a little bit of cost. And because of the situation, uh, yesterday we went to Oxford Street just to see what is happening. We found most of the stores having less stock and uh, goods are not there anymore. So you need a lot of uh, product now. Supply chain uh, has uh, disrupted seriously the storage facilities here. I think the shipping and the container and other facilities around the world is, are also disrupted. So now uh, Bangladeshi business people, they have some bargaining point in hand. They can add little bit of value to make some profit. And gradually, if they have some profit, it's uh, automatic, it's, a, it's like a habit that they move to a better product. Any product that gives a better uh, return. So the basic t-shirt producer is now planning to produce a polo shirt. A polo shirt producer is gradually moving to a sweatshirt. And a sweatshirt producer is gradually moving to produce a neat made jacket. So this is how the fashionable industry is gradually coming up. And especially because of price. A jacket costing $25 in China is now costing $20 in Bangladesh. So a $5 margin is huge when you import 100,000 pieces. That means you are uh, making additional half a million dollar. So everyone is running to Bangladesh. That's, that, that is the reason for that. Because when you import garment, it's not two, three pieces. It's 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 pieces. And if you can make one pound out of it, that means you are making 100,000 pounds. So it's because of the quantity. And uh, now a little bit of bargaining is having a better health of the factories. Thank you very much. Can I be cheeky and ask one more? Sure. Um, how do you feel leaving um, the LDC will affect the Bangladesh apparel industry? Uh, up to 2027, we have the GSP facilities available from Europe, Canada. Australia and some of the other countries around the world. So uh, I hope that till then uh, we'll be strong enough to have higher productivity. Because now what we are doing is we are not looking at the price, we are now looking at productivity. Because if you have higher production, the cost will automatically cut down. So we are importing machines and we are trying to produce 100 pieces where we were producing 80 pieces before. So this higher production will help the industries to still make the same margin when GSP facilities will not be there. But we will have GSP plus till 2032, so we have still 10 years to uh, cope up with the situation. Thank you for the question. Um, I think we'll probably have to wrap up there so that we can you know, network and, and, and enjoy the dinner. But I would just like to ask you, Chairman, are there any, uh, any final comments or, or thoughts you want to make before we conclude? No, I, I, on behalf of our Chairman of Bangladesh Export Processing Zone Authority, WASA, bankers, our colleagues from the university and uh, my colleague from the commission, we want to uh, invite you to Bangladesh. Oh, the son of uh, Samsung manufacturing plant is here. His father is making uh, Samsung uh, mobile phones, televisions in Bangladesh. And from March onwards, they will be making Hyundai cars in Bangladesh. The plant is almost ready. And their electronic Hyundai cars, they will start manufacturing from 2023 in Bangladesh, including the battery. So where is your father? On the way? He should be here today, coming from Bangladesh. 
All right. Tomorrow morning? Okay. So, uh, I, I, on behalf of all of uh, them, I would like to... Yes, please. Uh, my name this is, is also a very important thing that I want to say, that uh, 20 years before we were so afraid of the questions, today we have no problem with the questions. Please. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to ask the question. I'm representing uh, Ekatu Television in Kenya and Channelless Television London. Uh, my question is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, UK-based uh, business uh, uh, man is asking me how uh, you will engage uh, NRB businessmen uh, to invest Bangladesh, number one. And, uh, you know, the COP26 uh, climate change conference is, uh, you know, happening in, across the global and, and uh, global communities uh, is... Uh, challenging uh, how uh, people can get uh, to the net zero in 2015. So how the Bangladeshi uh, investors uh, uh, is more uh, will be more focused uh, in in uh, you know uh, fossil uh, uh, fuel free industry uh, and how do you engage young generation in the United Kingdom? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know about the carbon carbon emission, which is the issue. Bangladesh is one of the lowest carbon emission emitter country in the world. And um, actually, it's happening more in USA, China, and other countries who are having more carbon emission. So Bangladesh is already a country having a very lower level of carbon emission. Number two, we have uh, abandoned most of the new coal power projects that were coming up. And we are now heading to solar power and also uh, atomic power so that uh, we, we do not use much fossil oil in producing our electricity. Uh, wind power is also on the table that we are thinking about, the border belt, the sea belt that we have having enough wind, uh, we will be trying to use those and especially in the islands. So this is the green area where we are working on using the energy and you will be happy to know that the, out of 10 green platinum garment manufacturing plants, eight are in Bangladesh. So we have most of the green manufacturing of garment factories in Bangladesh. So we are already committed to the environment. We are also having green bonds coming up. So whoever is doing green we were promoting them. They have also fiscal benefit for the green projects now. And uh, in the overall country, we are having any industry having green uh, and environment friendly production and plan is having tax holiday also. So this is how we are promoting and we are trying to be more environmental fr environment friendly. And uh, uh, your first issue was uh, relating to connecting non-resident Bangladeshis expatriates living here. Yes, uh, tomorrow our presentation is also for them because now they should be more proud being a Bangladeshi born British probably today and they should feel uh, good about their motherland where they were born and brought up. And uh, now if they really want to have their savings uh, invested if you invest here in the bank, if you keep your money here in the bank, you know how much return you are getting. And tomorrow we'll show you how much return you will get in Bangladesh. You will, you will, be, to, you will be knowing tomorrow that how much is the frontier market, uh, as, uh, in the capital market, as a frontier market, the return on investment we are giving. So if you compare that with the Western world, Bangladesh is giving the highest return on investment in the frontiers market, as per the frontiers uh, market, uh, journal information and during the last one year Bangladesh was the best performer for three months in one year in the world. So these are the good things that we have and this is where non-resident Bangladeshis should, should be feeling proud of their country and we hope just not being a Bangladeshi just for their better return on investment they should now can and engage themselves to their uh, motherland. 
Thank you for the question. And yes, channeling the power of the diaspora is really important for right. attracting investment. So thank you for the, the questions and thank you for your interest. Most of all, thank you for your openness to answer all of our questions. Kimberly, thank you so much for sharing your insights and your expertise and giving us that regional view. And uh, thank you. And I'll hand back over. Tomorrow, no, uh, we'll have more experts in our show, better than me. So. If you come and if you have any question tomorrow, yes, sir. One question. You have a question? <laughs> then it's a difficult question. Tell me. I'm, I'm sorry, but we, we, we have a schedule. The chairman will be available for questions. And uh, what do you think is necessary for people like you, investors like I mean, his question is now to you, that now as you want Bangladesh to be in the world radar, what we should do from your chair? Advises well, for us. <laughs> Some fr free advice. Well, I Thank think I, I think that what's happening already is useful because there, there are the two strands. There is the most important strand, which is actually making a good environment for business, having good opportunities, having a good framework, having opportunities, making it easy to do business or making it easier to do business, skilling the workers, making sure all the conditions are in place for investors is the part one, um, which is obviously the hardest part and is complicated. The part two is communicating that to the world. And, and so it seems that a lot of work is, is already being done. A lot of opportunities are there. Processes are in place. There are opportunities. But now we all need to know about it. So outreach like this is important. Engaging with the media is important. Doing lead generation, being really smart and targeted and doing creating a, a value proposition, benchmarking Bangladesh against competitors, identifying key industries and understanding exactly your key strengths in those industries and not try to be everything to everyone. And then being um, extremely targeted, identifying the growth companies in those sectors and going after the investors, you have the best chance of landing. I know that that's in, in a nutshell and I don't want to go on too much and, and extend the event, but it's essentially the two halves, putting in the work, making the right conditions, but then crucially making sure that investors know about it. And that has to be more than a PR exercise, it has to be understanding the company's needs, engaging with them and building a smart proposition to explain why Bangladesh solves a business problem that they have, in a nutshell. <laughs> but we will learn more tomorrow, I think, as the chairman said. Yeah, I think you so add to that, I think what the gentleman was just saying then around like COP26, I mean, it's so top of mind for everyone in the financial space at the moment. And, you know, what you're saying around how the green credentials of Bangladesh, I think that's something that you should really be looking to promote. And I think the kind of perception is that with uh, kind of the low cost manufacturing of, of garments, I mean, that's something that I think a lot of people are very concerned about this kind of high churn um, of, of fashion, the fast fashion space, it's something that people in terms of green are very worried about. So I think if you can really emphasize a lot of the green credentials that you have in the country, that's something that would be really beneficial to encouraging greater investments. And also as well, just the fact that you said that the size of the population and how young the population is too. I mean, that's a, a real space for greater investments as well, because you have this huge population with many years ahead of them. And as the country becomes um, more of an emerging market and as it grows in terms of wealth then that's a whole new consumer base as well there so for a lot of investment opportunities that's a whole new um, audience new market for them to focus on so I think that's, that's kind of the two aspects there as well maybe a slightly contradictory as well but you have that growing consumer base but also having to emphasize the green aspect as well. Thank you. I don't have any closing remark, but I'll take a few minutes from you. I'd like to request the chairman of WASA and chairman of BEBSA to say a few words for you, because such an important people are here, and uh, if you want to say something about Bangladesh. Thank you very much. As the uh, chairman said that the perception 
we are here to change for you and how do you really look at this. I am the uh, executive chairman of Bangladesh Export Processing Zone Authority. Uh, in Bangladesh, we have the representative of 38 countries and uh, they have set up 531 industries across the globe. The brand that he has uh, uh, seen in UK, as you will also see tomorrow in our presentation, that makes our stand so firm in the global arena, starting from the apparel sectors to the many sectors. Uh, we are focusing on the diversified products and not really bogged down with the so much of so silly issues that our the economy becomes very vulnerable. As you can uh, you will learn tomorrow, that we have a very resilient economic standard. We take it to, we like to take it to a higher standard based on our trust and confidence with the investors and taking the total episode to a new grade of a uh, technology-based uh, environment meaning that we like to embrace the fourth industrial revolution as quick as possible, coupled with the digitalizations. Yes, I do agree that the few years back, the stories, as he has rightly said, every day we are changing. That is why we don't feel shy to take the questions and the, and the, and the bullet that you will be pouring onto Bangladesh. With regards to the uh, COP26, uh, we are worried that maybe the low-end product will create the emissions. No, we are ready to take care of all the issues. That means in our APJs, uh, uh, Central Effluent Treatment Plant, which is CETP and WTP, water treatment plants, is absolutely in vogue. And we don't discharge anything that pollutes the environment so long. So you are most welcome to visit Bangladesh. I will not take your much of the time, but we we'll love to have those um, uh, company by seeing at your own eyes. I hope to see you in Bangladesh. Yeah, and uh, we have uh, um, uh, many companies. Uh, tomorrow we'll show the profiles of those. Uh, I can't really name those. Uh, like FCI is one of the company which is uh, operating here in Bangladesh. They have more five industries. And as many as five entrepreneurs have almost 15 companies in Bangladesh operating. And many of the brands that you are using here, those are produced in Bangladesh. Uh, so good or bad or the quality, that probably you are the best just for that. But I do um, uh, take this floor to invite you to Bangladesh and to see that how things are getting changed every day. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, I'm sorry. I don't like to speak much because I know the, you are waiting for the uh, dinner. One of the things that I want to say that I'm from the water sector, and today I had a meeting with uh, Angli, uh, Anglian Water as well as with uh, Thames Water. And what we try to take, let them know that we have made a lot of changes in the water sector, not only compared to Asian countries, but compared to here even. Because our billing system, we have made it so sophisticated that without any human touch, now we are making the whole total billing system. There is no human touch of any people. So that's what is, uh, we have made a tremendous change and that is the place where a lot of investments are there. We have already made an investment of $2.7 billion and again $2.5 billion investments possibilities are there. So we'd like to invite everybody to come and see Bangladesh and invest in water sector. Thank you very much. Thank you, short and sweet. We will wrap up there, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much for the panelists and the moderator. Wonderful job. I can see from the enthusiasm of people wanting absolutely to ask their questions, and uh, it's wonderful. And we knew this was going to happen. That's why we insisted and intentionally structured the dinner to be informal, uh, in order to share information between a country that has so much potential and the international investor community and all the representative of the press that are here present. So I invite you all uh, to cross the hallway where you came from from the elevators, go to the other side, and we'll be happy to host you for a dinner over there where you can continue the questions and answers. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.